Thank you, Brother Randall, and I appreciate the good, sincere prayer from Brother Darrell this morning. As always, I stand in need of your prayers, but my prayer is that however much I stumble and fumble, the Lord will bless you to receive it in a manner that blesses you with the blessings that he knows you need. Again, I, I don't know, I mean, I know everyone here, but I don't know what you stand in need of, but the Lord certainly does. And like he did on the day of Pentecost, he can take the words of the speaker and convert them into a manner that resonates with your heart, and that message comes directly from him. Even though it may come through a speaker, that message comes from the Lord. This is Mother's Day, and I want to speak this morning, if I can, if the Lord will help us a little bit. Aim primarily at the ladies in the audience, and especially the mothers that are here. I've got precious memories over the years. As Brother Randall talked about Brother Darrell, he knew his Darrell's mother well because it was his grandmother. And we all have fond memories of our mothers, and I'm, I'm proud to say we've got some children showing up with their mothers this morning. That's always a special blessing. I, sometimes, you know, we kids don't appreciate uh, what it means uh, to parents uh, when we give them in homage and pay attention to them. We're directed to do so many times throughout the Bible. Of course, one of the very basic commandments, the only commandment that's not worded negatively. You know, we're not to worship false gods. We're, you know, we're not to swear. We're not to kill. We're not to steal. They've got all those things we're not to, not to covet. The one positive one is honor thy father and mother. And it's the only commandment that, that gives us a promise with it. Honor thy father and mother that thy days may be long in the earth. Honor your father and mother, and there's a reward that comes with that, is that you'll have the opportunity to live a life here on earth uh, that's blessed in, in ways, not only long days, but in other ways. I have good memories. I, I, I lost my mother at an early age. I was about 20 uh, when I lost my mother and have wonderful memories of her and going to church with her. I was blessed, and many of you know, with a stepmother for longer than I had my mother many years. And, and uh, uh, they both had their faults, but uh, I, I have good memories of both of them. And and now I continue to be blessed with a mother. I have a mother-in-law. And I know we make fun of our mother-in-laws, and I've made fun of mine with her. And we have fun with that. But uh, um, my wife, who I was married to, uh, of course, I lost her. And her sister was lost about three years after that. So my mother-in-law lost both of her children, natural children, over about a three-year span. And uh, I'll go see her this afternoon. She's out at the plaza. And sister living there now, where we've just moved to recently, my brother-in-law and I that, that married the two sisters, daughters of hers. So I, I continue to be blessed. Uh, that's, that's a blessing to me to be able to go out and, and try to honor her and try to help take care of her in the way best way I can. Mothers have a special bond with their children. Us dads kind of get left out of this from time to time because <clears throat> we can sit and watch and, and we love our children, but we don't have that special bond with them. And that's mentioned throughout the Bible, the love of a mother with a child. You know, any of you guys ever been raised on a farm, you ever try to get between a mother cow and her calf, you know that's going to be problems when you try to separate them out. It's the same way with a mother and her natural child, or even adopted child. I've had the opportunity to have been blessed to see that. Uh, the love that takes place between a mother and a child is wonderful, and it's something us dads miss out on. Uh, it just, it, the Lord has blessed the moms that way, and giving him that, that bond that no one else has. And, of course, we're told in Scripture that that's the strongest love bond that we know naturally, but even that fails in comparison with the love of our Lord for us. Because uh, we, 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 most times, I know we'll probably mistreat our mothers from time to time, uh, but we always come around to love them generally. But we mistreat the Lord a lot more than that, and he loves us even stronger. He loves us with what's known as a agape love, a godly love. The closest thing we know to that is a mother with her child. And it, it surpasses almost all the other love. If you look back in the history of the Bible, though, and especially the Bible times, I'm thinking about the lifestyles during the time of the mom, uh, then, uh, wives have had to suffer. Women have had to suffer at different times throughout the Bible. They have not enjoyed the same rights and benefits as the men have. You know, we know that today as women's rights and uh, women's liberation and, and giving the women, women equal uh, treatment, equal pay, all those things with the men. And uh, that's still a struggle that a lot of women face today. 
it was worse in the time of Christ. It was worse back in the olden days. And that's what I want to go over with you this morning. The greatest women's liberator that has ever lived is a man named Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to cover with you just a few minutes. The Bible is full of that examples. And I'll, I'll limit it down to a few. But Christ, to Christ, women were precious. And he elevated their status tremendously. He was the very first Women's liver, if you want to call that, that raised the value of women and said they're on an equal par with men. Now, we know, he said, there's different roles, and we're different. Men and women are different. We approach issues differently. We approach problems differently. And <clears throat> that's what I want to visit with you this morning. They're equal in the eyes of God, even though he's given us different roles in life, in the church, in the family. He's given us different roles, and we respect those roles, and we shouldn't take them out of context to indicate that Men or women are greater than any of each other. In fact, we see that they're equal. This starts, and I want to cover with you, basically start back in Genesis, when God created the earth. It's pretty interesting when you go back and look at the words that were used. Uh, we'll get to this point about men and women in just a minute. But in the second day, when he created the firmament and the, heaven, the heavens, he separated the waters from the heaven, and he said, let the dry land appear. In chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. When he created earth, basic earth, the heaven, the earth and the seas, he said it was good. And then in the third day, it said when he created this, the seas, in verse 12, it says, And the earth brought forth grass and herbs, it came foliage. At the end of that, verse chapter 12, And God saw that it was good. Everything he did, he summarized it with saying it was good. On the fourth day, when he created all the stars in the sky and the suns and the moons and the planets, at verse 16, it says, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the sun, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and he set them in the firmament, and he separated, verse 18, and he, he separated the darkness from the night, and God saw that it was good. At the end of every day, he looked back on his work and saw that it was good. And on the fifth day, he created all the animals, animal life of the seas and the airs. And we get down to the end of verse 21, and it says, God looked at his, what he'd created, and he said, and said it was good. Saw that it was good, and he blessed them, saying, multiply and fulfill the earth. And on the six days, he created the animal life that would uh, rule on the land. Every living creature, cattle, creeping things, bre uh, beasts, everything on the earth. At the end of that day, he looked back, and God saw what he had created was good. I want to come back in just a minute, but I want to jump over here to Genesis 2, where God looked at verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good. This is the first time he said this. Everything he's created has been good. Verse 18, the Lord said, it is not good that the man should be alone, and I will make a help meet for him. And out of the ground we know uh, the Lord who had formed every beast and brought them by Adam. He ran all the beasts two by two by Adam. He created two beasts of each so that they could multiply, male and female. Put them by Adam, and Adam named them all. Verse 20, and Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the fowl of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. None of these animals that the Lord created, anything created in the earth, nothing was found for Adam. Now, God didn't come and ask Adam, do you need help? Do you need a companion? The Lord didn't ask. Adam didn't even know that he needed help. But the Lord made a statement, it is not good that man's alone. And I can't, all these animals were created, there's nothing there for Adam. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and he brought her unto the man. The Lord knew what he was doing when he set up this world, created man, and he said, created woman, and brought him to the man so that they would have companionship. He delivered a bride, a wife, to Adam, hand-delivered by the Lord, hand-picked, hand-made. And Adam then, when he saw her, he must have fell in love real quick. And, uh, but Adam turned into a poet. He said, Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Adam wrote the first poem about his wife. 
This is from me. And he said, he, he called her woman then. And the Lord said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Man is not complete without a woman. That's what he's telling. Adam was not complete without Eve. And Eve was taken out of Adam. And then when he puts them back, when they come back together, they are one flesh. That's the completeness of that. Sometimes we know and then think in this world that, you know, we're better off if we're alone. But the Lord created them and put them together. He didn't, the Lord didn't ask Adam what he wanted. The Lord gave him what he knew Adam needed, and he created it up, created it together. There was none comparable, not any creature in the earth that the Lord had created. And these wonderful creatures he'd created, there was not one comparable to Adam, not one that Adam could talk to and visit with and exchange ideas with and have companionship with. And you know, especially us men in this world, you know, we first of all, we think of the companionship. We always, our minds go to sex every time. You all know that. And I don't like saying that word in this big a room, but we know that's what most of us men think. And, but we know that that goes away after a period of time, and that's not constant. But companionship is constant. We notice many times when spouses lose their husband or lose their wife, it's the companionship that they miss. Seeing them around the house and talking to them. Anytime some situation comes up, you know, and I mean whether it's gossip or ideas or how to raise their children, it works better when the two, husband and wife, have the opportunity to be together. The Lord created it and said, here's a man and his woman and they shall be one flesh. The intimacy of companionship is what the Lord was seeking for Adam. Now, I, I left where I left off back there. I'm going to go back because this summarizes what the Lord would take place in detail later at the end of verse 1. At the end of the sixth day when he created animals, God saw that it was good. But he says, it's not good that Adam's alone. And God said, now let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over all the earth. In verse 27 of chapter 1. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he male and female. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And we finish that in verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. Everything else was good. He said, but it's not good that I leave Adam alone. And when he put a wife with him, and we finish up the product of the earth and people, then the Lord gets here and he says, now it's very good. Not only do the, annual, the animals have companion, but we have men and women who are together here, and the Lord has blessed them. We go over here to chapter 5. We have the descendants of Adam's. I just want to point out one thing, verse 2. It said, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. In God's eyes, men and women are one flesh. Two come together and make one. First time we've had misaddition that actually multiplies and makes stronger what the Lord created. Created, put them together, and he says, and they became one. That's what the Lord did when he created our situation. He created it, men and, wo man and woman, basically equal. We've got different roles in life, but they're equal in their value to him. And in fact, it takes two of them together to actually be one. Now, if you look at what took place after that, that's the way God created it. And it took place over there after that. And you go back in the Old Testament, and I'm going to summarize here. But I made myself a couple of notes going back and, and researched on this. And if you look at all the other nations in the world, the United States and, and the free countries have come a long way. But still, even today, in some of the third world countries, women are not valued the same as men. And especially back in the times of Bible, Bible times, especially in the times of Christ. We know there's other nations and other religions that deny rights to women. They make them wear veils. They make them cover up themselves. A man has a right to abuse his wife and divorce her, but the wife doesn't have the right to divorce. Uh, <clears throat> he can, he, he has, the wife has no say, and even men in many places take other wives. And we know back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, the Lord forbade multiple wives. But men have taken that right on themselves. 
In Greece, in ancient Greece, back here in Bible times, a wife could not leave home without a man, could not eat or talk with other men other than her husband. She was held under lock and key, more or less like a slave. She couldn't go to school, wasn't allowed to public speak. In fact, in, in Greece, the famous Greek poet wrote the book about Pandora's box. Pandora, named after a woman, because Pandora's box, you know, you open it up and we have chaos in the world. Because at that time, Greece men, especially the poets, felt like women were the cause of all the evil in the world. That's where Pandora's box came from, is because all the evil in the world comes from uh, Pandora and from the woman. Any woman that misbehaved, the man had the right under the law to take her back to his home and, and beat her into submission, effectively. Even in Rome, the status of a woman was lower. As under absolute control of the husband, the husband had ownership of the wife. Now, this is not written law. This is not the law of Moses. This is oral law and man-made law. There's nothing in the Bible in the New Testament that would justify the way women were treated in biblical times. A man had power of life and death over his uh, wife in Rome. Divorce was easy for a man, not easy for a woman. Women were not allowed to speak in public. Female birth was discouraged. They just had enough females to have the uh, children for the men. But men births were encouraged. Even in the time of Christ in the Jewish world. Now, these are the Jews to whom the scriptures were given. In the Jews, the women were barred from public speaking, were not allowed to read in public. Now we'll talk about that in the New Testament here in just a moment. This is the time of Christ that he came into the Jewish world. Women were not given the same rights as men. The rabbis used to open every one of their services, Lord, thank you for not making me a Gentile, or a dog, or a woman. That's documented. That's the way rabbis opened the service in the synagogues. Husbands could divorce their wives. Wives couldn't say no. But women could, men could divorce their wives, and they put them out in the street. You know, they were asked that of Moses. I mean, they were asked that of Jesus many times about, is it right for a man to get a divorce from his woman for any reason? They couldn't testify. They were incompetent to testify couldn't speak to any other man. Now that's the way things existed in not only in the Jewish world but in all the other worlds around in Greece and Rome. Women didn't have rights. Now we know that it's come a long way since then and it's changed. What started that change? Well I want to contend with you that it was Christ. Christ changed man's thinking about women. He's the best friend women ever had because he elevated them to a status that they had not ever changed before. The best friend women have is Jesus. He made it clear it's not supposed to be like that. You know, when Jesus was questioned on divorce, and that's in chapter 19, the Pharisees came to him and questioned him and asked him and tempting him, says, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? He always phrased from the position of a woman. And Christ answers, have you not read, he's talking about scriptures, talking about the Old Testament. When he asked him about reading the scriptures, the New Testament hadn't been written when Christ was here. So he's talking about the Old Testament. Under the old law, Christ is saying, have you not read that he which made them, God, which made man and woman, at the beginning made them male and female. And he said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Jesus says, let's go back and start over again with this teaching, you guys. Let's go back to start and say, you're to be one flesh. If you're one flesh, you treat your wife like you treat yourself. And that's what the New Testament loads from. There's, there's lots of scriptures in that. Remember the other time when Christ was asked about uh, adultery in his Sermon on the Mount. And he stated, you know, well, it's been said that thou shalt not commit adultery. And that's true. And men, it always at that time, they phrased this in terms of themselves about not committing adultery. They said, you know, when a woman gets this and she commits adultery, and the Lord says, he, he reversed the tables and put it back on the man, it's equal. If a man looks upon a woman and lusts after her, he's already committed adultery. He took it and reversed the tables back. That it doesn't just belong on the woman. It takes two people to commit adultery, a man and a woman. Not just a woman that's committed adultery. Even the time when he was there and they brought, the Pharisees brought the woman out to him and says, we caught her in the act of adultery. Really, then he also had caught a man in the act of adultery too. Well, where was the man? 
He didn't bring them out. And Jesus, you know, of course, basically told them, anybody that's without fault, cast the first stone, and they all scattered like cockroaches. So he changed the entire thinking and everything he answered questions about women. He changed the status of them, and it's never been the same since then, the status that Christ created for the woman. Changed their status entirely. Let me go to one good example here. Uh, go to Luke chapter 13. That's where I think I want to go. Luke chapter 13. Good example of what took place beginning with verse uh, 10. Jesus was teaching in the synagogue uh, on Sabbath one day. And of course now this is Jewish temple, the synagogue where they were teaching. Men, the rabbis, led the service. They came down front. The men came down front. Women were relegated to the back of the room. They had to stand at the back. They were not allowed to speak. And no man touched another woman. No man talked to another woman that wasn't his wife. It was forbidden for the women to talk to the men that weren't their husbands. So we have a synagogue taking place. The men are there. The rabbis are down front. Jesus is teaching that day, so he comes down front. All the women are in the back of the room. Verse 10, he was teaching in the synagogue. And behold, there was a woman had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. woman has been a cripple for 18 years. And was bowed together. She walked bent over. That's how crippled she was. And could in no way lift herself up. She couldn't stand upright. And she was in the back of the room listening to the rabbis speak. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him. Come down front. Number one, violated a rule of the synagogue. A man rule. There's nothing in scripture about this. He said, come down front. Now, I can hear the gasp of all the men in the room. Come down front. You get to come down here front just like the men do. So he saw he called her to him and said unto her, Hey, you don't, the other rabbis are going, you don't speak to women. Jesus called her down front and talked to her. Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmities, and he laid hands on her. This is the Lord putting his hands on this crippled woman calling her down front. He's violating every rule of the synagogue right now. Called her down front, which she's not supposed to come, talked to her, and he laid hands on her and healed her on the Sabbath. He laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue, this is the head rabbi, the ruler of the synagogue, answered with indignation. Now look, he's just healed this woman of infirmities, and it's made the leaders of the synagogue mad. They're, they're just embarrassed and, uh, you know, what this man's done has been crazy. And he elevated this status. Number one, he said the women get to come down front too. And you get to talk to them. And you get, they get preached to. You get to give them the same benefit of the, of the gospel that the men get. He answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, there are in six days in which men ought to work in them, therefore... To come to be healed, not on the Sabbath day. There's a lot of times this woman could come and be healed. Doesn't have to come on Sunday. Now he's mad all the way around because what the Lord has singled out this one woman, whom everybody else probably ridiculed, made fun of, ignored. He had compassion on her and brought her down and talked to her, brought her down front. Women can sit on the front row too, just like men can, and talked to her and healed her. And they're criticizing him for it. And the Lord answered and said, "Thou." Hypocrite. It says, if one of you takes your ox or your ass and leads him to water, way to watering, you'd go take care of your horses better than you're taking care of the women. And ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham? Nobody had ever called women this before. Jesus said, this is a daughter of Abraham, just like you, maybe a son of Abraham. This is a daughter of Abraham. She's up on the same Status with you. Whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. He put everybody to shame for the way they treated this lady and for not elevating these women to the same status. He'd already gave them trouble about the adultery issues and about marriage, that the women have the same standings as the men do. We know there's two examples, and in, in a matter of time, I'll just cite to them. There's two examples where Jesus was uh, 
had his feet washed by women. Uh, we know we would more than examples than that, but one in particular we know where he went and had a lunch at Simon's house, uh, the uh, Pharisee, and a woman came forth who was a sinner. We believe that was probably Mary Magdalene. She came forth and she washed his feet with her tears and wiped his feet with her hair and then anointed his feet with oil. And she came down front and they were criticizing of this woman. What is the Lord doing letting, number one, a woman come down if he's really the Lord and coming down and coming in in front of all the men down front and washing his feet? And the Lord turned his back on Simon and spoke to the woman and blessed her. She's received a blessing today for what she has done. She has just as much right to come down front as the men do. We know later he's over in the house of Martha and Mary. In Martha and Mary's house, and we know Martha gets unhappy because Mary's not helping her wait on her guests. Instead, Mary is down front, down in front with the men listening to Jesus talk. And when she's criticized, when, when there, he's criticized for allowing that to happen, he says, Mary has chosen to do the right thing. Women's job is not always in the kitchen waiting on us. They're entitled to hear the gospel preached just like everybody else. Across the board, in Luke, there are 24 times, I believe if I counted correctly, 24 times that Jesus engaged in conversation or treatment or preaching to women. He elevated them up on the same status, gave them the exact same uh, level of treatment for women as he did men. He was the first one to ever do this. Again, no one had ever called women daughters of Abraham. They called the men sons of Abraham. Jesus elevated their status. From his time forward, if you want to look and see the change that's taken place, uh, for, whether it's Rome and Europe and then in America, it all began with Christ. And he said, this has changed. You know, the women are to be treated equal. We know there's in, in there what, what the mistake is made is because women and men and women are given different roles in this life from raising kids to, to uh, in the church and in the family. But they're treated equally, and in the eyes of God, they are equal. And God was, uh, Jesus was the first one that changed this status for all women. John 4, the woman at the well, is another good example. And I wanna, I'm kind of skipping over these, rush through them, and hope I don't bore you with that. But the woman at the well, Jesus came out of his way to meet this woman at the well, this Samaritan woman, who the Jews didn't have anything to do with Samaritan, didn't have anything to do with women, were not supposed to speak to them. Jesus went out of his way to see this woman at the well and confront her. A Samaritan woman, half Jew and half a Syrian. And he met her and talked to her and went out of his way to convert her, convince he, her, and of course he could do that. He put himself in her heart. And look, this woman had been married five times and living with a woman, a man then who was not her husband. So she'd obviously been guilty under the, the Jewish people's eyes of adultery. And yet Jesus went out of his way to spend time to her and talk to her. And she kept asking, why are you even talking to me? Jews don't talk to Samaritans, especially Samaritan women. When his apostles came back around, what are you doing visiting with this woman, especially this woman that's a Samaritan? They didn't know what he knew. And she'd been married five times and living with a man then. We know that chapter starts off with saying Jesus and his apostles were out baptizing. They were baptizing lots of people. But yet Jesus used this woman. She went back into town and told everybody, come and see, this guy's the Messiah. He used this woman as his messenger to that entire town, and it says then here come all the people out from the town to see what this woman had convinced them from. There's no question in my mind, they were there uh, baptizing. They were at Jacob's well, and those apostles baptized a lot of people that day. My question is, did they baptize that woman, the woman at the well? She'd been married five times, six. Jesus gives us this perfect example. I believe she got baptized that day. Our problem is today is, I've, as I've said this before, if she came down the aisles of this church, that same woman, and joined, would we baptize her? We go back and look and see what Christ did. Christ was heavy on forgiveness, especially those people that came to him, believed him, repented and confessed. He was big on forgiveness. He was real big on equal treatment. I want to close this, and I promised you I'd let you go early today. Let me close with one scripture out of Galatians, the book of Galatians. When, when Apostle Paul is telling us here about how the gospel works, how Christ's salvation works, he says, there, there's a time 
For as many as you as have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Verse 28 of chapter four, of 3. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's no difference between Jews and Gentiles under my doctrine of grace. Jews and Gentiles are treated the same. I say you all provide my salvation all of us. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. There's no slaves in this world and free men. I treat you all alike. You're all children of the Lord. And there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. We're all equal in the sight of God. That was Christ's law, and that's the way Christ treats us all as equals. We know over there, Apostle Paul gives us great lessons in Ephesians, as does the Peter on how the treatment ought to go between husbands and wives. And the husband, you know, the ones we always like to cite are the woman is supposed to be submissive to the husband. He's the head of the household. What we miss many times, it says, but the husband is to have knowledge of his wife. We're to know you. I think I preached on this a little over a year ago, this part where uh, there when after Melba died and I was started dating after about a year or so, my two kids gave me a booklet. Everything that men know about women, you open it up and every page is blank. My kids had a good time with that. That's the trouble with us men on our side is we don't really know our wives like we're supposed to. If we, this thing is working the way it's supposed to between husbands and wives, we are equal. We do come together, and we do make one flesh, one body, and make our decisions like that together. That's the secret of how we're supposed to be. Apostle Paul teaches then that husbands, not only we know our wives, we love our wives like we love ourselves. That's true of kids and their parents, too, and especially their mothers. Anybody that loves themselves, loves other people like they love themselves, is going to take good care of themselves and other people. That's hard. I don't know of anybody I love more than me. I have my own faults, but I love me more than anybody else does. If I would love other people, including my parents, my mothers, my wives, those types, we would love those. A lot of problems that we have today that we see today would go away if we truly took time to love each other as we love ourselves. That's the doctrine of Christ. All these times when we have these issues we have about mistreatment and discrimination, those are what comes out of the lust of our own hearts and our pride and our ego, our desire for power. That's not the doctrine of God when he created us. That's not the doctrine of Christ. He created us equal, and we're to be equals in his sights. Now, again, we're different. There's no question about that, and we struggle with these differences all the time about how we're different from each other. But it's our job to learn each other, to learn how to please each other, to know each other. You're supposed to know when you're going to make your husband mad and he's going to make his wife mad. We don't ever figure that out, do we? But we ought to try always, and we ought to learn. We ought to learn to appreciate each other. That's the doctrine of Jesus. Focusing today on the women, but it works both ways because the women have had to suffer this discrimination over the years, but it was changed by Christ. That discrimination has come from man. It has not come from God, and it has not come from Christ. We are like, in, in a sense, the, the way God created husband and wife is like he did the Godhead. We know there's the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And those three are one. They're one God, but yet they have three different functions. God's the creator. God the Father is the creator. God the Son is the Savior, came and saved us. God the Holy Spirit is the comforter. He's who come and, and, and visits with us and lets us enjoy church service, lets us enjoy prayer, lets us get in and answers our prayers. Those three are still one. But that's the way the husband and wife are supposed to be. You're different roles. We've got different roles to do. But together, we're one. And that's the way we're supposed to look at it. We serve a wonderful Lord who set up the rules for us according to his creation. If we could learn to follow those rules, we'd be very happy and blessed. We get outside those rules because of our own pride, our own egos, because we fail to forgive so many times. Y'all have been kind to me with your attention. My prayer is that the Lord will richly bless you, and we want to honor all mothers for Mother's Day.